And now, please welcome Dr. Philip J. Santangelo. Hello, everyone. Don't, let's see. Okay, it is on. Um, so I'm Phil Santangelo. I'm a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Emory and Georgia Tech. I'm also a PI um, in the DARPA PREPARE program, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Basically, where are we? What have we, what have we accomplished, actually, uh, in the few years that the program has been running? But before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about what PREPARE is about. Because it's an incredibly innovative program. It was actually quite frightening even, even applying for it, because I thought, you know, this is, this is incredibly innovative, this is gonna push us to the limit, but at the same time, it was very exciting. Uh, the program, I think, was the brainchild of Renee Wegerson and uh, has been continued by Amy Jenkins, two folks that you've uh, seen today. And uh, I have to admit, they have been, both of them have been incredibly supportive of the work that we've been doing. But what's really interesting about PREPARE was that it was really about trying to come up with a new paradigm for how we deal with threats that are important both to the general population and to the military. And so that has been, um, I, I guess, at the forefront of, of our thinking. And the new paradigm was using CRISPR. And I'm not going to get into the details of CRISPR in general, but what it does is that these CRISPR proteins give you this rapidly reconfigurable platform, a platform that allows you to move from threat to threat and hopefully allow us to deal with new threats very, very quickly. And I think that was the real difference about um, this program more than anyone, any other. I do want to mention one thing, though. We do not cut DNA, for those of you familiar with Cas9, in the program, but we use CRISPR in other ways to actually um, essentially get the warfighter to be prepared for, for these new threats. So, uh, that's right, I'm supposed to actually do this, uh, move the slides. So, uh, we have an interdisciplinary team, folks from Emory, Georgia Tech, uh, Duke, um, UGA, um, lots of different universities in, in the area and beyond. And the whole point of these CRISPR drugs, well, the first thing I should mention is what are we actually delivering? So how we deliver these CRISPR drugs? And we use, that, we use mRNA. So you've heard about messenger RNA. You probably have uh, a bit of it in your arms. And so, but we use it from a therapeutic perspective. So these are RNA-based drugs. And there were two types of drugs that we were developing. One, essentially using CRISPR to modulate gene expression, change the gene expression in your, in particular cell types to deal with a particular threat. The other was an activatable RNA, something called Cas13. And that enzyme we actually deliver with a messenger RNA, targets viruses, and allows us to chew up their RNA. And what's interesting is we've been able to adapt this to multiple pathogens. So our goals, we started out with just flu, and so we were supposed to just focus on influenza. And then about a year, even less than a year into the program, COVID shows up, and so we have to pivot. And I have to admit, this was the first chance for us to, say, to test the hypothesis is this really a rapid configurable system, or was that just a hope and a dream? Well, we did it. We were able to very easily change just one part of our drug and move it from COVID to flu, and now we're even combining the two. So we started out with flu and, try, and trying to develop uh, prophylaxis and therapeutics for flu and COVID, and then we went ahead and have now extended it to dengue, which I'll show you some data from. A little data doesn't hurt. Um, and then the actual project pivoted in another direction, and that they didn't have, to be honest, I don't think there were any performers working on a prophylactic um, drug for nerve agent toxicity, and so we actually took our, uh, one of our CRISPR drugs, reconfigured it again, and were able to address that issue. And there's a lot more work to do, but in general, these are the kinds of things that this rapidly reconfigurable system allows you to address. And so, so what is the drug, what do these drugs look like? So for the one for our respiratory viruses is essentially an mRNA that encodes Cas13 along with a guide RNA. So it's two RNAs that we combine together and we've been working on polymers for delivering them into the lungs. And specifically they could be inhaled using a FDA approved nebulizer. And so we first had to find some new polymers. Delivering RNA into the lungs is actually not that easy. And so we had to start from one polymer. We then changed lots of different parts and pieces, the end capping, the branching. We then developed our own very simple device for actually delivering these by nebulizer to live animals. And uh, we were able to measure their expression directly in their lungs. And that's what the little glowing uh, green pictures are of actually uh, allow you to see expression in their lungs. And then we screened a whole bunch of polymers and we found a winner. 
And what's interesting about that winner is that that winner not just works in mice, which is, you know, we'd like to save mice, but we'd really rather be saving people, um, but it works in hamsters, which were our COVID uh, model at the time, uh, ferrets, which are a very good flu model, non-human primates, which are the closest species to ourselves, and swine, which are also in a, another good flu model. And so we were able to get expression in all of these species using the same polymer formulation. And just to show you on the right, I, um, you're actually looking at lungs from a hamster and all the white there is expression of protein. So we get expro expression in lots of, in the main two parts of the lung uh, where these viruses will end up. Um, and the nice thing is that, again, it expressed well across all of those species. So I mentioned cas as a drug. And so what cas is, it's a nuclease. You can think of it as a little Pac-Man that chews up RNA. And you have the protein itself, which we express from an mRNA, and we co-deliver a guide strand, and they make a complex together. When they bind to their target, it activates. The Pac-Man activates. So before that, it's not doing anything. It's kind of hanging around. And then once it activates, it starts chewing up RNA. And so far, we have found it to be very effective against viruses. And so we started, um, we actually started with flu, but I wanted to show the COVID stuff first. So, and I think this was a good, again, a good test of how the whole system. So we had the original SARS virus genome. We then went ahead and had uh, Washington one very quickly uh, from the CDC. We aligned them. We found two regions that were highly conserved in the nucleocapsid and um, in, in its polymerase. That's not too important other than they're conserved. And I should say this, the guide that we found that works, so the blue, the purple circles that um, where you can see mostly purple, that's where we save the cells from COVID. And so this was a good thing. We knocked down the virus by three orders of magnitude, so we were super happy about that. But that guide is still conserved today. So even in BA5 and some of the newer variants, that region has not changed yet. So we could find a region that would target the virus that hasn't changed. You all are familiar with the fact that the virus is changing all the time. Um, the new vaccines are bivalent to account for some of that. But this, this particular part of the virus hasn't changed. And so the question you might have is, does this work in an animal? And the answer is yes. So in this experiment, what we did, and maybe the graphs are kind of confusing, but the one on the left is what's really important, the one that has the weights. And so we actually compared our CRISPR drug at um, a 50 microgram dose versus an antibody that came from Jim Crow's lab, actually at Vanderbilt, at 1,000 micrograms, and we were really neck and neck. But we used 20-fold less drug, number one, and number two, we delivered it by nebulization, not giving it in by IV or IP, which you really can't do outside of a medical uh, setting. So we were able to deliver a drug that was pretty much equivalent, but in a much more and much easily more feelable manner and with far less drug. Since then, we actually compared it to molnupiravir, uh, single dose, head to head, and we were much better. The red lines are from our drug. Uh, the uh, green is from molnupir uh, molnupiravir. So we did much better than that. So we were happy about that. And then we actually combined it recently with a couple of different doses and actually hitting not just the virus, but a host gene, a gene that's a host restriction factor. And that worked really well. And so on the right, you can see the, um, the actual uh, plaque assays from that, uh, TCID50s, and basically the amount of infectious virus. And we were massively decreasing the amount of, of infectious virus. So Again, it's configurable. We can go after the virus. We can go after host factors that are involved in, in virus replication. It gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we affect the virus. In flu, we did the same kind of thing. We actually did some work with the CDC. We found a sequence in a gene called PB2 that was highly conserved. It actually hits 99% of uh, essentially H1N1s, H3N2s, and H2N2s that have existed over the last 100 years. And so it's a highly conserved sequence. What's nice about it is that it works across, it does really work across viruses. So on the left, on the bottom, we used a number of different H1N1s, pandemic strains, and H3N2s, and it worked against all of them, not just in terms of decreasing RNA, but e decreasing viral titer, and it works over about four days. So for our perspective, we thought this is great, this is moving in the the right direction. And so what are we doing next? We're actually combining guides for flu and guides for COVID. We call it Fluvid. And so hopefully it'll be our Fluvid drug. And actually with the reemergence of RSV becoming a big pain, we may actually add, R add RSV to it too. But the point was that here we just tested the same, the Fluvid drug against COVID. We're testing it against flu shortly, but it worked, it worked well. Decreased RNA levels, decreased titers. So, so far we're moving towards our Fluvid drug. 
So the next thing I want to talk about is dengue. So dengue is an important pathogen worldwide, and it's incredibly important, I think, to the war, war fighter. We don't have um, the vaccine for dengue is a bit problematic. You have to have dengue first because you can get antibody-dependent enhancement from the vaccine. So that's not so hot. And at the same time, as far as I know, there are no drugs against dengue. There's one small molecule that was published, but that's the only one I've seen. So we thought, could we, again, reconfigure this one more time? And so we took our basic drug, an mRNA that encodes for cast we then added, we screened guides, and that's what you're seeing here is in those graphs is that we're screening guides, and they're lowering the virus by almost two, two orders of magnitude, um, both at a lower MOI and then a higher MOI, so the amount of virus that we use. And uh, we screen them, the little, what you're seeing on the right are pictures, the green dots are essentially double-stranded RNA. That virus, dengue, when it replicates, makes double-stranded RNA. It shows replication. And you can see with many of our guides, not many green dots. That means we're actually preventing the virus from replicating. So this was really exciting because this is another totally different virus that all we had to do was change the guide. So same drug, and we changed the guide, and we were able to go after dengue. So you have Influenza, you've got COVID, and now you have SARS-CoV-2 and dengue. Very, very different viruses. We've tested against, now so far, dengue uh, serotype two and three, and we're working on one and four. And the next question you might ask, does this work in an animal? Because we can do all the cell culture work we want, but at the same time, it's the rubber meets the road when we get this into an animal and show a therapeutic effect. So in this case, we had mice that are susceptible. They're actually immunosuppressed, and so they're very susceptible to dengue. And uh, they were infected. We then gave, the vir we gave our drug one day later, so truly a treatment. Um, we gave our drug, and it wasn't given by nebulization. In this case, dengue actually is in lots of different immune cells throughout your body, and so we give it systemically, so the route of administration is different, but again, it's the same drug, an mRNA that encodes Cas13 in a guide, and I think what's really important for everyone is that the, the graph all the way to the right that says percent survival. So the ones that got our, got, received our guide, the actual active uh, m mRNA and, and guide, 8645, they all lived. <laughs> Unfortunately, the ones that get the controls, not so much. About 60 to 70% of them actually uh, don't make it. But the point being, we were able to save all the mice. And so this is really, really exciting from our perspective. So now, this is just, this guide works against dengue two and three, and we're gonna combine it with guides that work against dengue one and four. The other thing I want to note is we, we did measure how much virus was in the bloodstream, and you can see at day two and day three, when the virus is most active, how much we're really suppressing um, the replication of the virus. So, and this is exactly what we wanted to see. And I should note one thing. All of these, most of the experiments, except for one that I showed, we only used one dose. So if you think about most small molecule treatments, you're taking probably two doses a day for five or six days. This is one dose, and this is much, much lower amounts than what you'd be giving in a small molecule. And so I think that that's another advantage. You may not be able to dose every single day, depending on the environment that you're in. If we can give you one dose and it has an effect on the virus, that can be quite significant. So we're really trying to show you both the reconfigurable nature of this. This is why CRISPR is so important. We're using mRNA, so it's transient. We're not permanently affecting anything. And so I think that it really helps from a safety perspective. And we're only giving one or sometimes two doses. With dengue, this has all been one dose, actually. Uh, and we're going to look at longer when we move to non-human primates and maybe multiple dosing. But these are the kinds of the power of this type of approach. So we had to pivot. There was another, another project that kind of came along, and that was, what about organophosphates? Okay, um, Sarin, VX, Soman. These are a significant threat, Novichok. I mean, these are definitely an issue, and they're an issue for the warfighter and for folks that are put in an environment where they may be exposed to them. Um, as my former student, Jared Beiersdorf, talked about yesterday, um, this is a significant issue. And so right now, there are, um, there are countermeasures, but those countermeasures do not prevent um, brain damage in some cases. And so we really wanted something that we could give the warfighter that would put them in a much better position. I'm not saying that you wouldn't, they wouldn't use their masks, but what if that mask gets broken? Uh, they're often in environments where they may get, that mask may break, seal may break. Can we actually prevent any toxicity from that, from, from the nerve agent? So 
Totally different paradigm. Now we're using a gene modulator. So this is a dead version of Cas9, so it doesn't cut DNA. But what it does is it allow us, allows us with our drug to target parts of, the, of DNA and turn genes on. So the gene that we're turning on is BCHE. Uh, and the reason for that is that BCHE scavenges nerve agents. And so we're actually going to turn that gene on. We're going to use your liver, your own liver, because we, we encode for that gene, uh, to make lots and lots of BCHE. And BCHE would then scavenge the nerve agent. And so this would be something that would be given likely before, but we, uh, before, they would, you know, before they might experience a, a nerve agent attack. But at the same time, we do have schemes to use... In, in rapid response. Those are coming, uh, I would say those are lagging slightly behind, but, but those are in progress. And so we have this mRNA that encodes the gene activator. We have another guide that basically targets the BCHE gene. We also add one other thing, and that's a, a little tiny peptide, polyproline uh, uh, domain, that we also express with an mRNA. We've added some things to it to make it more stable. But the, but the point is we have three mRNAs. So basically, you know, again, this reconfigurable system that we deliver in a lipid nanoparticle, so similar to what, what's in the vaccines, goes to the liver, and then the liver turns the, the gene gets turned on and it makes BCHE. And this really is what I wanted to show you. So the line that we needed to achieve was about 300 units per mil. That's been estimated to give you about five LD50, uh, five times the lethal dose protection. And right now we're at about a million and we've boosted, when we give a second dose of this, we've made it up over to, uh, so it's 300 units per mil, I should say, uh, up to about 1,000 and then now up to almost 3,000. The point is we're making lots of BCHE. And so we're making plenty of it. And we think we can keep this on for even much. This is for about a week, but we should be able to keep it on even longer. So I guess that means that I'm probably supposed to stop soon. <laughs> I'm going to guess. So, but this is the end of my story in general. But so I think that's pretty good timing. But hopefully we'll be able to move this forward. We have got some tests in mice, uh, more mice actually, uh, along with the U with the army uh, with an army lab to test this further, and then hopefully move it into non-human primates. And I really hope this ends up in the warfighter. So thank you very much. And, and so now I'm going to introduce James Dahlman. Uh, James is also a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Tech and Emory. And he's going to talk to you about lipid nanoparticles because delivery is, with any nucleic acid-based therapy, it, at the heart of it is delivery. So, James, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate it. Great Here talk. You thank you. Have fun. So, hey, everybody. How you all doing? Um, my name is James. I'm an associate professor in the uh, Department of Biomedical Engineering here at Georgia Tech. Um, I'm also the Chemistry Foundation Early Career Professor. And today I'm going to talk to you about something that I think is an important part um, of PREPARE. Um, I think what Phil just outlined is, is critical. Um, but I say part because it really is a team effort, and I'll kind of get into that. But the sort of role that my team plays in this, in this is trying to get RNA into the right cells. Because all these cool RNA therapies that, you know, Many of us have been injected with, whether it's the vaccines or there's some other FDA-approved RNA therapies or the stuff that's going to be coming out in the future. Long story short, that therapeutic RNA, that drug doesn't work unless it gets into the right cell, so you have to deliver it the right way. Um, so as mandatory disclosures, I co-founded a company called Guide Therapeutics uh, on delivery, which was subsequently acquired by Beam, and I'm an advisor to uh, GV, which is Google's venture capital firm. Um, so when I think about the field of RNA therapeutics, you have to kind of understand, for those of you who don't know me, I've been doing RNA delivery my entire professional um, life. I started in 2009 doing the uh, siRNA delivery, small interfering RNA delivery, and then moved on to mRNA in the early 2010s, and I've been doing that since. With the pandemic, um, a lot of things changed. I mean, that's an obvious sentence, but for within the delivery field and the RNA therapeutics field, specifically, a lot of things changed. So as I mentioned, both the uh, Moderna and Acuitas uh, BioNTech Pfizer vaccines are obviously mRNA-based vaccines. Oop. Great. Thank you. Um, and when you looked at what RNA therapeutics sort of needed uh, to move forward into patients, um, there were a few things. You needed, uh, all right, do you guys just wanna, we'll just riff with this one if that's okay. All right, so here we go. So, okay, so on the RNA side, you needed a, a, a great mRNA that you could manufacture. 
Okay, so back before the pandemic hit, uh, there were a few companies that were working on mRNA, but the manufacturing at scale wasn't quite there. Obviously, when the pandemic hit, that skipped ahead like 10 or 15 years. All right, so the manufacturing now is there. Um, you also needed the sort of interest from investors and from people who really knew how to make drugs to move that along. So that also skipped ahead like 10 or 15 years. The delivery vehicles for the vaccines were already established. So if you think about the delivery vehicles that you were injected with, they're called lipid nanoparticles, LMPs. And as you all know, you got injected with it in your arm. And it kind of went to the immune cells that were floating around, got drained out. So the delivery systems were kind of there. But if you look at the next generation of RNA therapeutics, it's a completely different story. The mRNA manufacturing is there. The investor and translational interest is there. So everything is primed to make next generation RNA therapeutics except for the delivery. So right now, as it stands, if you're a patient and you're getting treated with an RNA therapy in an early stage clinical trial or an FDA approved drug, you're being injected with an RNA that goes to your liver. Vaccines are different, but everything else goes to your liver. So we can make everything, the interest is there, and we can deliver it only to your liver or do it locally for vaccines. That means if you have cystic fibrosis and you want the RNA to go to your lung to edit out CFTR, or excuse me, replace CFTR, if you wanna do um, BCL11A for sickle cell, if you wanna do beta thalassemia stuff in your bone marrow, if you wanna do tumor stuff, you're kinda of out of luck because we have everything we need except we can't get it to those non-liver tissues. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so long story short, if the RNA can't enter the right cell, it won't work. And as a result, the field works, uh, looks for uh, delivery vehicles. Now, the end of that sentence is relatively controversial, but I think it is unfortunately true. Um, I don't mean it to be too, hard, too harsh of a criticism because I am a delivery person myself, so I've also looked for these delivery vehicles the wrong way. But my field for about 20, 30 years now has used this sort of prescribed method to find a delivery system. And long story short, except for the liver, nothing has worked. And so I think that we're looking at it the wrong way, and I'll explain why I think that's the case. So when you, if you were a scientist in my field and you said, hey, like we said, the mRNA manufacturing is there. We can make the mRNA at scale. Um, the interest is there. Uh, you have all these cool cast nucleases now, like Phil was just talking about. And so I want to go after uh, CFTR. I want to go you know, find an RNA drug for cystic fibrosis. Or I want to go after T cells to do some immuno oncology. Or I want to go and cure sickle cell or whatever. Um, You'd say, okay, well, I need to target the lungs or wherever, so oh, how do I do that? Well, I don't know which nanoparticle is going to work the best, and so I'm going to make a bunch of them. I'm going to make a bunch of different delivery systems, big, small, charged, neutral, whatever, and then since, well, if I make 5,000 different drug delivery systems, I can't run a 25,000 mouth experiment that's both uh, impractical and unethical. Um, I don't know what to do. Well, I'm just going to test some cell lines. I'm going to put a bunch of cells in a dish, and I'm going to see which ones work in the dish, and I'm going to go from my 5,000 nanoparticles drug delivery systems down to three or four. So I'm going to throw out 4,995 of them, and I'm going to test those remaining few in, in animals. And then the, if one or two of them work in mice, I'm going to go to rats, I'm going to go to NHPs, and then that will get me into the clinic. So it's this sort of funnel that starts with cell lines. And the reality is that that's not an efficient way to go along. Because if you look at cell lines and you say, okay, well, how well do the cell lines predict delivery in the mouse? The relationship is actually zero. And then mouse to rat's probably pretty good, but then as we'll see later, mouse to primate is pretty poor. So you use this funnel, but the node, node one to node two to node three in that funnel is extremely inefficient. So if you're looking from sort of conception to clinical trials, like one over inefficient to the fifth power, which is pretty bad. So what we've been doing in the lab is we combine big data and nanomedicines, these omics, these big like genomics like data sets, to test a bunch of particles at once. So basically run thousands of experiments all at once. The way we do this is by barcoding particles. Um, basically you take, you say, okay, like we said, we aren't sure which nanoparticle is gonna work. Maybe it's a big one, maybe it's a small one, maybe it's this, whatever. You can make thousands or tens of thousands of these, but you don't know which one's gonna go to the lung. So you say, okay, well, I'm just gonna make all of them 
And nanoparticle one is gonna be tagged with DNA barcode one, or in this case, A. Nanoparticle B with chemistry B or structure B is gonna be tagged with DNA barcode B. A DNA barcode is simply a DNA sequence that you can read out that you know what it is, like 23andMe. You mix them all together, put them into the animal, and then take out the lungs, and then in this oversimplified schematic, you see, oh, there's a bunch of orange barcode. That means that nanoparticle C is better than nanoparticle A or B. So this would be a three experiment at once. This would be three experiments at once. We can really do thousands of experiments at once. Um, and we've used this to actually look how well, at how well cell culture predicts delivery in the animal. Remember, everybody uses cell culture to, look, to predict delivery in the animal. So here's a line showing cell culture versus cell culture, perfect correlation, just like you would expect. If I do an experiment in cell culture and then do another experiment in cell culture, again, cells on the dish versus cells on a dish, perfect correlation, perfect predictivity. Here's the relationship between cell culture and the animal for the same cell type. There is no relationship at all. And this is sort of an existential problem for the field because Papers that we used to publish in my lab and most of the papers in the field still use the x-axis to predict the y-axis. So anyway, the nice side of this, so that's all negative stuff, okay, whatever. The nice side of this is that the ability to test a bunch of things at once has actually been now validated. So we published a bunch in the lab. We spun out a company called Guide Therapeutics to commercialize this. And Guide Therapeutics was very quickly acquired by a company called Beam Therapeutics, which has now used our stuff to do a number of things. And if you're curious about where some of this Georgia Tech-based technology has gone, I would just encourage you to read some of the Beam Therapeutics press releases on lipid nanoparticles or LMPs, and you'll see that they're really being used. And so, you know, this barcoding approach, testing a bunch of things at once, works in our hands, works in the hands of the startup, works in the hands of the startup that bought our startup, and then moving on up the line now. So I want to talk about it now briefly about some of the things we've been doing more recently in the lab, again, testing a bunch of things at once. So we are able to test entire libraries of particles all at once, directly in animals. So again, you know, you can run the equivalent of hundreds or thousands of experiments in basically one animal. And we've done this to deliver mRNA to immune cells, which could be kind of interesting. We've done this to compare delivery across um, in what we would call fancy mice, which are mice that have like human livers, primatized livers, or mouse livers, and you can actually see that there's a species dependence. So we can actually look to see how delivery changes as a function of species, again, all in one experiment. If we had done this individually, this would have been, this would have been uh, by my estimation, a multi-million dollar experiment, but we were able to do it in an afternoon. Um, and now, more recently, we've actually been able to look at delivery in what we call single cells. And for those of you in the audience who do have a biological background, I think, I hope, hopefully I'll be able to convey the excitement here. Every, again, for those of you who don't know me, um, every few years I see a piece of data or a data set that makes me go, oh, wow. You know, I think many scientists can relate to that, whether you're a biological scientist or not. You know, you see a lot of data, but every once in a while you see something you go, oh, wow. And this was a data set that made me do it. First time in five years where I was like, wow. And that data set is right here. So for those of you who are biologists, what you're looking at is on the left side, you're seeing the single cell data that's just a standard, what we call a Tisney plot. So every single dot is a different cell. So you're looking at every individual cell. In this case, it's within the liver. Different colors mean different cell types. But again, every dot is one cell. And then what you see in the middle is how well your nanoparticle actually delivered the mRNA. And then what you see on the right is how well different nanoparticles worked relative to one another. So you're looking at an entire library of nanoparticles in every individual cell. And you can do this in theory in any species that you would like. And so we've used this now to deliver mRNA to the spleen and a bunch of immune cells within the spleen. Again, you're looking at every single dot is an individual cell. And we know whether the nanoparticle got there or not at the single cell level. Um, and the reason why I get so excited about this is because the field for a long time, including us, has been using images like on the left, is the spleen glowing or not? And we're now changing that to looking at individual cells within the spleen. So we're going from left to right, and that makes us excited. Uh, so with that, I wanted to thank uh, Phil primarily and a bunch of other collaborators here. Of course, DARPA for the funding to do a lot of this work in the lab. And um, I'll just leave it with this, which is that everything's ready, uh, but we need to get better delivery. And, Hopefully we can do it a little bit more efficiently. So thank, thank you very much for your time.
And now we're going to welcome to the stage uh, Professor Gabe Kwong, a colleague of ours who's going to share some really exciting work that he's been doing. He's a total superstar, so Gabe, welcome to the, uh, Thank welcome you. To the talk. All right, so welcome everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Gabe Kwong. I'm an associate professor here at Georgia Tech Emory, um, and I'm waiting for the slides to load up. So th these are my disclosures. I do have uh, equity ownership of Glimpse and Port Therapeutics. Okay, so by way of background, I wanna first share with you what we do. We, we are not an RNA lab, and we are not a lipid nanoparticle lab, but we do have collaborations with uh, the team here at Georgia Tech, which focus on developing these new therapies. But the primary focus of my lab is dedicated towards engineering the next generation of immunotherapies. And whether this be sensors that are more sensitive or whether there are cells that are smarter than the cell therapies that we have in the clinic. Um, and so it is within this backdrop, I wanna share with you a very short story how we're thinking about lipid nanoparticles and how if you could deliver lipid nanoparticle cargo to antigen-specific T cells, like how enabling that would be. Um, so by way of background, for those of you who haven't taken immunology, but you, this is probably already intuitive, um, our body contains hundreds of millions of different clonal types of B cells and T cells. And here for this particular cartoon, I'm only showing you the repertoire of alpha, beta, TCR, T cells, okay? The point I wanna make here is we have a large uh, diversity of these cells because there are many different types of pathogens uh, that we need to protect our body against. Now, this makes it extremely challenging, but also is the basis for what we call antigen-specific cytotoxicity, right? Because amongst this large pool of cells, there always will be, likely, a handful of these clones that will recognize the next influenza virus, the next coronavirus, et cetera, okay? And so what typically happens is when you are infected, a small subset of these clones are activated. They expand many, many fold until they're in circulation up to several percent of your total lymphocytes, could be these antigen-specific T cells, uh, and then they provide protective immunity, okay? So why do I bring this up? Well, it's because the classes of immunotherapies that we have now that are on the market that we use in patients today these are broad spectrum immunodrugs. Whether you're thinking about cytokines or checkpoint blockade um, antibodies, the reason why they're toxic, it's not because they directly exert liver toxicity, it's not because they directly exert neurotoxicity, it's because they're activating cells that you don't want to be activated. They're activating endogenous T cells that can target, for example, self-antigens. These drugs are potent because we're breaking tolerance, right? So basically we're trying to get cells for example, in the context of cancer, to basically kill our own cells. So that's why these are, are, are challenging. Um, and so part of the DARPA program, we've been thinking about how do we make these lipid particles uh, a bit more specific, especially in the context of antigen-specific delivery, because we want to avoid this kind of off-target activity as much as we can uh, to, uh, for these autoimmune subsets. And so if you look at how does a T cell recognize uh, whether a cell is an infector or not, well, it's through these very specialized surface proteins, right? These MXC molecules, these were, already, uh, these were originally discovered in the context of transplant, and these are the basis for basically a lot of our diversity. But the MXC molecules, they present peptides. These peptides are typically derived from healthy proteins, but in the context of a virally infected cell, they will produce, or they will present peptides, and that's the way that the cell uses, uh, the T cell uses to, um, <clears throat> to, to differentiate and kill the target cell. So we create these lipid nanoparticles. These basically are preformed lipid nanoparticles that we can now do a post-insertion step where we have recombinant peptide MXC molecules that have been site-specifically modified that we can put in a lipid tail for post-insertion. And so here's some of the, the data in vitro. So here we have a particular cell line. This is a P14 T cell. It expresses a particular T cell receptor that binds to the GB33 antigen. I'll just say it's a cognate antigen. You don't really have to uh, get mired in the immunological jargon. But you can see that this is essentially very much akin to like a high affinity reagent that you can get a fairly uh, specific binding. And this binding is dependent both on the MXC uh, allele as well as the peptide sequence that you're using to load uh, that particular, uh, the, the antigen presenting nanoparticle. So we've done some in vitro transfection. This is, again, very idealized situations. This is just using a luminescent mRNA. And you can see that in the context of an on-target uh, PML or off-target PML T cells that don't recognize this particle versus a on-target system with the P14 T cells, you can see um, a, a basically a sweet spot 
as you're increasing the number of MXC molecules to lipid uh, ratio on the particles. So this works uh, fairly efficiently, at least in animal models. This is a transgenic mouse model where all the T cells are engineered to express one particular receptor. So this, is the, this doesn't exist in, in the real life situation, but you gotta start somewhere. Um, and you can see uh, in the second row, the GP100 DP APN, that is the control uh, formulation where it's not, doesn't present the right peptide, but right below it, the GB33 DB, that is the situation where you're presenting the right peptide to this particular T cell clone, you can see that you can get uh, increased uh, luminescence uh, showing transfection, a successful transfection of the spleen over the control particles. Uh, you can dig a little bit deeper and you can ask, well, what are the cell types that uh, this particle can deliver to? We looked at the different uh, classical uh, cells in the spleen, right? The, the B cells, the dendritic cells, macrophage monocytes, residents, uh, uh, phagocytic cells in the liver. We certainly saw those, a uh, bit of transfection. But what was striking to us is we, we also saw uh, transfection of uh, T cells, in this case, that are specific to a flu peptide. Okay, so one of the challenges, if you were to think about scaling, uh, typically for a particular virus of an average size, you would have more than just one immuno, what we call immunodominant peptide, okay? As you take the viral proteome and you chop it up into pieces, there are many peptides that could lead to an effective immune response. And so one of the challenges of going a protein route is you have to think about protein expression paths. And for a classic way of making these MXC complex, it actually is a three day long process and you don't have a, um, a good way to make high throughput complexes. And so what we've done is we borrowed from the immunological literature <clears throat> where you can actually assemble these MXC molecules with a photocleavable peptide. That peptide is completely sacrificial. It's just there to stabilize the complex. But what this allows you to do is <clears throat> you can array that precursor into a 96 well plate, for example, and in a five minute light, uh, exposure step, be able to swap out the peptide. And that's what we've done. Uh, we can sh this is a slide to show that uh, you can successfully you know, swap out the peptide that these particles are presenting. Uh, the key is on the left, you're looking at the blue versus the red. You can see that they are basically identical. The blue are particles where we've made the conventional way, and the red are the particles where we've made through the UV light exchange. Um, and in vivo, we've also tested this. Uh, these particles, they do target and they do transfect to the same extent uh, compared to the conventional um, uh, lipid particles. Okay, so I, I have uh, a few more minutes. I do just want to spend uh, the rest of my time to just tell you where we're going. Um, the first is that we are moving into uh, formulating these particles to transfect human T cells. And what's nice about this is the vast majority of us have been infected with certain viruses like EBV, CMV, and influenza. And so your average donor, your healthy donor uh, that comes into my lab and donates the blood, uh, we can actually fish out those, those viral specific peptides and very quickly, <clears throat> or those viral specific T cells and figure out very quickly how we can formulate our particles better to deliver to these uh, virally directed T cells. And here is an example on the left-hand side for this particular donor, <clears throat> Uh, this person has very little CMV specific T cells as shown on the left plot, and they have a very large percentage of uh, uh, influenza targeting T cells. And we've basically amplified um, the, the T cell component here. And again, on the right hand side, we're doing these in vitro set, uh, studies where these are now decorated with human leukocyte antigen MXCs. They're not, these are not the mouse versions, but these are human HLA molecules that are now presenting either influenza or a CMV peptide. You can see that there's a differential um, uptake of these uh, of this luminescent reporter uh, in the in the in the flu specific T cells. So we're we're taking this type of data. We're moving into an in vivo setting. We're looking at adoptive cell transfer models where these human T cells will be engrafted into immunocompromised mice uh, with, with the full complement of all the PVMCs uh, to see uh, the the transfection efficiency in that situation. Okay, and the last piece of data slide is that of course working closely with Phil's lab, uh, that Dr. Santangelo's lab. <clears throat> we also are working on delivering different types of CAS constructs. These are a little bit tougher because the mRNA is a bit bigger than the, the small reporters that we've been using. But some early data, we can see that, that we do get um, uh, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15% transfection, in, again, in the antigen-specific population. And of course, once <clears throat> you are able to think about delivering mRNA that's encoding uh, CRISPR, CAS, GUIDE, you can think about all the variants that you're able to do. It could be base editing, it could be uh, turning on multiple genes. And in the context of T cells, 
Uh, one thing you should know is that the antigen is one thing, but the complement of cytokines that pairs with that antigen skews the immune response towards one where it could be productive, where it could induce tolerance, or one where it could uh, hyperactivate the cells to overcome um, uh, restrictions on its killing. Okay, so that's my talk, and I want to end. Uh, obviously, I want to thank DARPA for uh, funding our work for this particular area in the last couple of years. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ida Su, who primarily drove most of this work, and of course, um, Phil Santangelo's lab uh, at Georgia Tech. So thank you very much.